uh, let's talk about the little guy uh, on the cover of the book because because you you found him. Yeah, Tick Tollick. Um, that was just a wonderful uh, moment in all of my all our lives. Everybody who's been involved with that. Um, it was not just a moment, it was spread over about six years. <laughs> um, we started a, it's a creature, okay, so if I was to hold it in front of you, uh, what you would see is a creature about you know, four feet long, and the smallest one, the biggest one now we know, is about nine feet long. But you'd look at it at first and you'd say, ah, it's a fish, because you'd see scales in its back and, and, and fins with fin webbing. But then it would look strange. Um, it, it has a flat head with eyes on top, much like an early amphibian. It has a neck, and no fish has a neck. Uh, and then if you look inside the fins, which we did, um, took them apart actually, you see it has an uh, upper arm bone, forearm bones, even portions of a wrist and a palm. It has a shoulder, elbow, and a wrist. It, it's sort of a, a mix of fish and amphibian. It's about 375 million years old. We found it in Ellesmere Island, um, and we started our search for this creature in um, 1998. Uh, we had the idea then, and it took us about four summers over six years to find it. A lot of, a lot of failure and lessons learned from failure. So th this is one of those transitionary species. It's it's one of the things that those anti-evolutionists hate because they always go, there's no such thing as a, and now you can go, it's, well, actually, uh, here he is. Yeah, and that's why it's, it's gotten such traction. Um, and that's a visual example of, you know, of a creature with transitional features. Um, you know, I remember when, um, after we found it, so we found it in 2004 in July, and it revealed itself, because it was embedded in rocks when we found them, there were a couple specimens we found. Uh, it was prepared out over you know, about half a year to a year. While that was all going on, there was a big trial down in the United States, in Pennsylvania, um, uh, between in whether intelligent design should be taught in the schools. And I remember one of the things that often came up is the argument there were no transitional fossils in evolution. Oh, and there's you know, this creature <laughs> sitting on my desk, you know. <laughs> it's, um, it was a pretty remarkable moment, actually. <laughs> So this this guy, uh, I'm surprised uh, you didn't name him the push-up, because cause he, <laughs> I mean, that was sort of his claim to yeah. fame, I guess, that he could do, and I guess that, I mean, it makes sense when you go from a world that's just water to sticking, literally sticking your snout up above it to see what's going on. Yeah, and you know, if you look at the fin and the shoulder of this thing, it, it, for a fish it looks unbelievably overbuilt. And the joints look overbuilt, the shoulder, elbow, and wrist look really overbuilt, until you look at how they put together. And when, you know, you think of, you know, doing a push-up, what do you do? Your, your hand and palm lie flush against the ground, your elbows bent in a particular way. Well, that's what this thing was built to do. Um, and it was clearly an animal that was able to support its body with its fins, uh, able to, with both gills and lungs, uh, able to uh, live both in the sort of the shallow water margins of the streams, ancient streams we find them in, as well as in the mud flats. Uh, you know, it was an amphibious kind of fish. I guess at some stage an embryo at least to a beginner's eye, is an embryo is an embryo. They, they look, and even some of the illustrations in the book, you look at it and go, wow, that's, that's not so different. That, that looks very much the same. Yeah, I mean, you know, to an expert eye, you'll see differences. Actually, they are different, but there are really, really important similarities between a shark, uh, a fish, a turtle, and a human, for instance. I mean, all of them have head development that begins the same way. All of us uh, develop initially in the head area with a series of swellings in the throat area, They're, that in fish become structures that support the jaws and gills. This is the gill arch? The so-called called? gill arches, yeah. In us, and after a few weeks after conception, you see them in a human. Uh, the cells in them give rise to jaws, uh, ear bones, uh, portions of our throat and voice box, and as well as the muscles and nerves that support all that. In fish, they become you know, gill arch structures um, that support it. So, you know, you could, we'd like to think, in terms of how we make the comparison, you know, many of the structures I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the structures you're using to hear me with right now, correspond to structures in the gills of fish and sharks, and we know that through development as well as fossils. You know, it's, it seems bizarre when you describe some of this stuff. Yeah, the ear bones in mammals and humans are, you know, relate to jaw bones and reptiles, but then you look at the fossil record for that, it's incredible. You can just see the back of these, uh, you know, the uh, reptile jaw is composed of many bones. And you see several of them just get smaller and smaller over time until they end up in the ears of mammals. It's remarkable. You see the same thing in development, too. It's a really amazing story. I found, uh, I found the book kind of humbling at, at times when, I, when you look back at the, especially DNA, and it's, um, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, by the way, this gene sequence, uh, it's also in this monkey. And you're kind of like, well, I could, 
take that. I have the, I, I can handle the seven different monkeys. Oh yeah, and this rat. Oh, yeah, and this, and it gets down. To, when it got down to slugs, I was <laughs> and worms. I was starting to feel really uh, very, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the sponges give people problems. Too. <laughs> it's like I don't even get, don't even get me started on the sponges. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, let's not go there. But um, yeah, it's wonderfully humbling, but it's also wonderfully empowering because you realize, I mean, what biomedical science, what biology has done over the past century is really make a big bet that by studying other organisms, by other studying other creatures, their genes, their biology, we can provide discoveries that tell us about human health. You know, if you look at the Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology in the last few years, I mean. It, the book should have been called Your Inner Worm because, um, you know, the discoveries from this little insignificant looking worm that lives in the dirt, it's the size of a comma on a piece of paper, um, you know, it's telling us how our own DNA works. Um, you know, and when you think about discoveries that are likely to provide cures to major human diseases, including many cancers, some of them are going to be derived from the work on this tiny little worm. You know, so when you talk about humbling connections to the rest of life on the planet, let's also think about, yes, it is deeply humbling. and and deeply aesthetically beautiful, actually, that our humanity emerges from that. But it's also empowering that we're going to find tools to our own health about our own you know, situation in the world and improving it uh, from these very simple creatures. The book is Your Inner Fish, A Journey into the 3.5 Billion Year History of the Human Body. I've been speaking with the author Neil Shubin and Your Inner Fish, published by Pantheon, distributed in Canada by Random House.